Second Kings chapter 4, if you'll stand with me. So glad to be here this morning again. Second Kings chapter 4. And beginning in verse 8, there's a lot of scripture this morning, and I don't really know that there's any that needs to be skipped. Um, I don't think I can, I know I can't tell it as well as God wrote it. So we'll, we'll probably read a little and, and then preach a little and then read a little bit more here. But 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 8 says, And it fell in a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where it was a great woman. And by the way, God called her a great woman. This was God's view of her. And I want you to know if you're here today as a woman and you know God is your Savior, the potential in you is infinite. Because Christ Jesus lives in you. The Spirit of God indwells you. And you can be a great woman of God before a holy, holy God. It says, And she constrained him to eat bread. And it was so that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. She was one of those people that said, if you're ever passing by here, would you please come? And she meant it. You know, some folks are just being nice. They really, and you kind of sense it, they really wouldn't want you to stop in every time they pass by, but they're just trying to say what you should say. She really wanted him to stop in. She really liked being around the man of God and liked her family, her husband to be around the man of God. And she said unto her husband, Behold, behold now I perceive." She perceived, it doesn't say the husband perceived, it said she perceived that this is a holy man of God which passeth by us continually. He seems to pass back and forth through here. They, they must have lived someplace that was kind of in the middle of where he traveled a lot because back and forth uh, he was passing by there quite a bit. So she says, let us make a chamber, I pray thee. Pray just means ask. Let, let us make a chamber, I pray thee, on the wall and let us set for him there a bed, a table, and a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be, when he cometh to us, that he shall turn in thither. They wanted to be a blessing to the man of God. This man had good doctrine. He had God's truth. Those are the people that you welcome. Can I have you hold your place here and turn with me to Second John just real quickly? We're living in a day and time when there's so many people that believe so many different things and some of the people that believe things that are not biblical, they're pretty active about spreading the word. What do you do about that? In this case, a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, real man of God was passing by and she welcomed him in and she made a place for him and she loved him and she cared about him. But what do you do if somebody else is coming by that doesn't teach the truth, doesn't preach the truth? Well, the Bible says in 2 John in verse 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Not necessarily the antichrist, but an antichrist. Anybody that's against Christ is an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Listen to this. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. You don't have God living in you if you don't believe right about Jesus. Okay? The doctrine of Christ, doctrine, the gospel, what the Bi it means to teach, the doctrine of Christ, what the Bible teaches about Christ. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speak. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. And every now and then, you may even have a person who's a part of a cult come to your, come to your door, and some of them know to do this. Some of them, when they leave, they'll say, God bless you, just to see if you'll say it back. You shouldn't. We, God can't bless that. They're out teaching false doctrine about the Lord Jesus Christ. But in this case, here was a solid preacher. Here was a Bible preacher. Here was a man of God, and she welcomes him. They make a place for him. And if you go back to 2 Kings 4, we're now in verse 11. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto, and he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. You just really watched over us. What is to be done for thee? What can we do for you? Wouldst thou be spoken of uh, for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. 
Hey, let me ask you a question. Do you know who you are? Are you okay with your identity? Now listen, if you don't know Christ yet, you shouldn't be okay with your identity. But once you do know him, you can be okay in your identity in Jesus Christ. What makes you of tremendous value is the person of Jesus Christ living inside you. Not what you do to make a living. But who you are in Christ is what gives that tremendous value. And he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood at the door, stood in the door, and he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thy handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. She's like, You know I want a son. Don't tell me I'm going to have a son if I'm not going to have a son. Please don't lie. But then she had a son. And God always keeps his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be in your house this morning. Please speak to our hearts. Lord, as uh, the Word of God is open, there are promises in the Word of God that it will not return void, that, you, that it is powerful and quick and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so then, Lord, we also pray that you would give us a desire to receive what you have for us today, that we with open hearts and minds would come wanting to be shaped and molded into the image of Jesus Christ through the very, very powerful Word of God. We pray for souls to be saved today, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I want you to know, if you don't already, you probably do, there is a tremendous attack going on in this country right now. There's an attack on your family. There's an attack on your wife. There's an attack on your husband. There's an attack on your teenagers. There's an attack on your children. There's an attack on your faith. And there's an attack on your family. And we're not going to beat it any other way than just giving ourselves individually to Jesus Christ. I want you to understand something. You're not going to win by doing better, trying harder, because this person that has orchestrated this attack is none other than Satan himself. He's literally had experience with every man, woman, and child that's ever walked on the face of planet Earth. Do you realize when... And I know you do, but just let me just remind you real quick. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, it was Satan that tempted them. It was Satan that tricked them. He was there. He watched the first two. He influenced the first two to sin. And then he's watched every person since. It's not only Satan, but when Satan was kicked out of heaven, he took a third of the angels, a third of God's messengers, a third of those with him. And they're now Satan's angels. They're Satan's messengers. They're Satan's workers, Satan's helpers. Demons, devils, the Bible calls them. And they're at work, and they're smart. They're, they're recording how we are. They, let me tell you something. Years ago, they came up with this thing that there's four personalities, and, and I'm okay with that. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. That really does help. It helps us to kind of get an idea of how someone may react, why they may react, and I'm all for it. But I want you to know something. Satan's got a little bit more intricate detail than he's one of four. I'm telling you this. Somebody just like you has lived before you. Satan knows what it would take to get in your head and to mess up your heart and to get you off track. He's done it many, many times to many, many other people just like you. And I'm, I'm not talking about 100% just like you, but I'm talking about so close to just like you. There's never been anyone 100% just like you. There have been many people very, very, very similar. You're not unique in your situation. You're not unique in the things that have happened in your life. Uh, I like to say it because it, it's kind of funny, but it's also true. You are 100% unique just like everybody else. So everybody else is special too. <laughs> talking about that word special. Sometimes it's not that good to use that word anymore. But uh, this mastermind's after you. He's after your head, he's after your heart, and he's after your actions. He wants as a man, he wants us to, to destroy the leadership in our home. He wants to get us off track. He wants to destroy our marriages. He wants to destroy our children. In this case, you have a, a, a man and wife in here in, in the Bible right here. And you've got a wife that seems to be very perceptive spiritually. She's very open to the things of God. 
And you know, I'll say this, and I think it's okay. Many, many times women are more perceptive. Uh, if you're married, there's probably been a time in your life when, when your wife, uh, you were driving home from church or you're driving home from the store or you were driving home from somewhere and she said something to you about the way some other woman looked at you or did something and you said, what? And then she told you and you said, what? And then she told you. And she was probably right and you're probably wrong. Two days ago, had nothing to do with that, but... Um, um, somebody, I'll just tell you so you don't have any weird thoughts in your head. Miss Jeannie texted my wife. And Tammy said, I don't think she knows what we're doing tonight. I said, yeah, she does. She knows exactly what we're doing tonight. Um, Pastor Hall would have told her. And uh, so we get there to do what we're doing tonight, right? Have them over for dinner, get there to do this meeting. And she's like, well, if I'd had any idea this is what we were doing tonight... I'd have brought, you know. Tammy picked up on all that from like uh, four words in a text. And I'm like, how do you get that? I mean, I, I'm like, she says, maybe I'm just being too sensitive, but I don't. I, I said, I think you're being way too sensitive. Well, she wasn't. She was right and I was wrong. That's just how it is. Well, this woman that just loves the Lord and loves God's men, lo well, loves this pastor anyway, this preacher, she decides to, help him. And the husband goes along with it. He's not a terrible guy or anything. He just wasn't <laughs> as perceptive. And she, he goes along with it, and they start doing this. We come to the point in this, this historical account now where uh, the pastor, the, the preacher, the man of God, he wants to do something special for the family, especially for the wife, because she's been such a blessing to them. And so he tells her, you're going to have a baby. Now she's thinking to herself, I can't really have a baby and my husband can't have a baby and don't promise me things that we can't do. But they do have the baby. And the baby begins to grow up and the baby gets old enough to go to work. The baby gets old enough to go out and help dad, in other words. I don't mean be the sole provider, but go out and help dad. And it says in verse 18, And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And it says, and he said unto his father, my head, my head. And he said to a lad, carry him to his mother. So we'll talk about that later. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. So here's this woman who, when she could ask anything of this preacher, even I'll bring you to the king, I'll take you to the leaders of our land. She says, no, I dwell among my own people. I'm fine. Now this preacher puts in her head the idea of having a child. And she says, don't put ideas like that in my head. I, you just don't know how much I'd want to have a baby. And don't, don't disappoint me like that. And, but she does have the baby. And now the baby dies. He's not a baby anymore, but he dies. And she called into her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. Run to him. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. And she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. You just go as hard as you can, and you keep going as hard as you can. And don't think about me. You just go as hard as you can. And if I need to ask you to slow down, I will. But otherwise, you just go as hard as you can. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off. He saw her coming a long ways out there. He said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, yonder the, that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with thy child? <clears throat> and she says something very interesting. It is well. In case I forget, let's just look at this. So she's coming as hard as she can, as fast as she can. Gehazi is coming as hard as he can, as fast as he can. He gets to her... Elijah's back there somewhere. Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with thy child? It is well. Was it well? No. I don't have time to talk to you. I got to get to him. I got to get to God. I got to get to God's man so I can get to God. Now today as a believer, there's one God and mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And if you're saved, he lives right in you. 
You don't have to get to me to get to God. But she didn't want to spend any time with Gehazi. She wanted to get right to the man that she knew could get to God. So much so, it is well, and she just kept right on going. And she finally gets to Elijah. And when she came to the man of God, to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Gehazi, I don't know what's wrong with her. But you leave her alone. There's something really wrong with her. Then she, then sa then she said, did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? And he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thy hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. If any salute thee, answer him not again. And lay my staff upon the face of the child. Look at verse 30. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. Elijah? Send him if you want. Send him if you will. But you're coming too. I'm not leaving you. I'm not going to trust you to come. I'm going to walk you over there. We're going together till we get home. My son died. And I'm not going to be okay with that. My family's not okay. My son's dead. And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child. But there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awakened. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. And he went in therefore and shut up the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child. And the flesh of the child waxed warm. But he wasn't alive yet. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times. <laughs> Most of the time parents get wor worried when their kids sneeze. This is a good thing. And the child opened his eyes and he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in and fell upon his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. I want to ask you this morning, verse 26, is it well with thee? And this is church, but the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, I don't know if it's going to pop up there, yeah. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them be, or end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Hey, if you can't come to church and be honest before a holy God, if we can't come to God at church, if we can't come to this place that Jesus purchased with his own blood, this assembly of believers, and, and at least before a holy God say, God, it's not okay in my family. He asked her three questions and really he asked her more because when he said, is it well with thee? That was a Hebrew custom that really involved three things. It meant, is it well with thy health? And let me just say, health is a big thing. You are body, soul, and spirit. And with the way that we work, we, we work we're emotional beings, we're intellectual beings. You have a mind and a, and, and a will and emotion. And I can show you this. Your heart is your mind, the thinking part of you. It is the emotional part of you. And it is the decision-making part of you. And you can't have your body get sick, uh, your body, soul, and spirit. You can't have your body get sick without it affecting you otherwise. So if you've been sick for a while and you're starting to get discouraged, um, realize that that doesn't make you a horrible person. It makes you a human you were a human before you got sick and thought that, man, there's nothing in my whole life could ever get me down. But now you're down and now you're doubting yourself. Like, there must be something really wrong with me. Well, yeah, you've been sick a long time and that's really, really hard on people. The other two parts of them. Obviously, it's hard on the physical part. But it's also hard on the emotional part and the spiritual part even. 
And that's why when we're hurting, by the way, always, we should always turn to God. We should realize always, even in the good times, that he is our all in all. And if God would ever use the goodness of God to bring us to repentance, then we must repent when he's good. You understand what I'm saying? The Bible says that God can use the goodness of God to bring men to repentance. Of course he can use brokenness. Of course he can use defeat. Of course he can use difficult, horrible trials beyond comprehension to break us and bring us to a point of powder so he can add the word and reshape the clay into the image of Jesus. But he also said he wants to use his goodness. So if you're one of the people here that's in good health and good strength and good this and good that, let that break you. Let that make you closer to God. And if you're one of the people that's struggling with health, just fall on your face before God and humble yourself before God and embrace God in the hurt because he will meet you in the hurt. Now let me say something. Is it well with thee? He's speaking to a woman here. This is the direct context, right to the woman. Is it well with thee physically? I'd say that overall women have more little, okay, I'm speaking in general, you know, you can correct me afterward if you want, that's okay. I'm speaking in general, and I know I'm right on the, in what I mean. I hope I can say it in a way that you, that you understand what I'm trying to say. But in general, I'm not talking about major sickness, the stuff that kills you, that type of, I'm talking about just in general. They have more ups and downs with health and, and feeling good and feeling bad than men. Now when a guy gets sick... It's serious. <laughs> and really, teens, you, you need to know this, especially you teen girls. When a guy gets sick, he needs his head touched. He, 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 I can't explain it to you, but it's really important that you walk up and feel his forehead and go, oh. What can I get you, Dad? I just love you so much, and I hate to see you feel bad. Can I rub your feet? Okay? I mean, you need to go all out for dad, okay? <laughs> and if it goes more than a couple of days, you just like intensify the wonderfulness of yourself until finally it's really tough for him to know whether he wants to get better or not because it's so great being sick around here. Now, if a lady gets sick, it goes something like this. You know, the first day, everyone's, you know, sad for her. And if you get that, ladies, you've, that's something, hey, you know. But about the second or third day, they're all mad at her. She's over there needing her head felt, needing her feet rubbed, and she's really, truly sick, and, and she's not taking advantage of anybody, and she's the one that normally nurses everybody, and they're just flat mad at her. Mom, do you know the laundry's getting backed up? Do you know what we had for dinner last night? She's like, yeah, I had to eat your junk too, you know. (laughs) And it's funny because it's true, but on the other side of the coin, it's serious. If, If a woman's not cared for when she's not feeling good, she's not gonna feel loved. If she doesn't feel loved, she's not gonna feel secure. And one of the primary needs of a woman is security. And the weirdest thing, um, that isn't necessarily the primary need of a man, but he expects so much when he's not well. And the average tendency of the average man is to give very little when she's not well. And she really needs it. I mean, the way God made a woman, she needs it. More than you needed it when you didn't feel good. And so this is important to the marriage. And this is important to the, whatever's important to the marriage is important to the children. Whatever's important to the marriage is important to the home and to the, the impact and to the church and to the impact God has through your home and through your church to your community and to your state and to the world. It's important stuff. And yeah, that's kind of funny too. So I'm not, and, and that's great that it is because it helps us kind of be honest about it. But it's important. That Hebrew term, that, that phrase, I guess you'd say, it, it meant more than just your health. It meant your prosperity, your finances. 
Now, I want you to understand something, because I know there's a lot of this prosperity preaching out there. We're not talking about that at all. God promised to take care of us. He promised to give us what we need. We have a tendency to want more than we need. We have a tendency to go beyond the provision that God's given us and put ourselves in situations that are just stressful. And so I'm not talking about here uh, how much a person makes. We're talking about here this, this, is it well with you? Is it, is it well with you physically? Is it well with you financially? Prosperity? Are, are, do you have what you need? Are you eating? Do you have what you need? You take away the home, take away the mortgage payment in this country, the United States of America, and the average home, the average family is in debt seven years. Much of that on credit cards, which is 20 you know, it just varies. It just varies a lot, but many of those credit cards are 20 to 20 plus percent. And let me just give you really the basic reason why is we're not satisfied with God. And so we want more, and we want more, and we want more. And I hope that we, in all this wanting of more, I really mean this, that we get whatever it is we think is going to make us happy so we'll realize that it won't make you happy. And I hope whatever it is that you think will make you happy, you can get without it costing you too much, because if it costs you too much, that could be real devastating to everything. But I hope it doesn't cost you too much to find out, wow, my parents, my grandparents, my pastor, people that love me from church, good people in my life, all my whole life have told me, money can't make you happy, stuff can't make you happy. And I finally realized it. I just knew if I ever had this, I'd be happy. But that doesn't make me happy. And it doesn't make you happy. And so what we need to do is go to the back of the Bible and let's just do real quick, just, just do a little finances 101. Put God first. Amen. Put God first. Just put God first. Because when you put God first, it just puts you in a spot where it puts you, in a, it puts you under the protective umbrella of the word of God. It just puts you where you're supposed to be, in obedience. And it puts you in submission. It puts you where God wants you. And also, yeah, there's a ton of other wonderful things that happen because by putting God first, now you're supporting the preaching of the gospel all over the world. By putting God first, you're having a part in souls being saved here and abroad. By putting God first, you're actually laying up for yourselves treasures forever and ever and ever in heaven. Putting God first is really interesting because in the end, when you put God first, you put yourself right up there close. Because the very best possible life is the life where God has the preeminence in your life. Number two, don't spend more than you make. Amen. If your outgo equals or exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. You go in to buy a car anymore, it goes something like this. Well, what can you afford? What do you mean, what can I afford? What, what, what's the maximum payment that you can handle? So you want me to make the maximum payment I can handle? So you can be the last guy to get my money before I lose everything? Because if I tell you what the maximum payment I can handle is, that means if anything goes wrong with anything else that God's made me a steward of, that he's allowed me to steward over, we're going under. Do you really want me to tell you what the maximum payment I can handle is? And by the way, you don't want to live like that. Again, he's talking to the wife, and remember how important security is to a wife. And let me just say something, probably make somebody mad, you know. I'm not doing it on purpose, but it may need to be said. It may be that she wants to purchase something that you know in your heart. We don't need to be purchasing. We cannot afford that. And she may get mad at you for not buying that new car that you cannot afford. But she'll sleep. And she'll be healthier. And in the long run, one of these days, she'll thank you. Because her greatest need, not the greatest in the whole wide world, but the greatest need between needing a new car you can't afford or security is security. Maybe it's the husband that has the spending issues, the spending problem. And everything he sees, if it flashes, I mean, we got to throw money at it, you know? Well, listen to your wife then. Thankfully, there's hardly ever a couple where you're both spend freaks. 
There's hardly ever a couple where you're both conservative either. <laughs> so if you're one of these couples that has a little friction in that area, you're normal. And that's true. You just don't want to listen to the devil on that stuff. And then, this, it had a third meaning. It went like this. Are, are you at peace mentally, emotionally? Are you stable? If it's true that one of the primary needs of a woman is stability and security, then there is no greater person for any man in this whole church or any man in this country to turn to than God. And there is no greater person than any woman in this country to turn to than God. And then to submit to whatever God says about every issue that comes up in your life because that will truly bring the most security that could possibly be experienced on planet Earth is to humble ourselves and submit ourselves to whatever the Bible says about whatever it talks about. Period. Right now, 25%, like a full 25% nationwide, worse than the state of Utah. 25% nationwide women, uh, women in this nation take some kind of a mood-enhancing prescription. Wow. It's worse in Utah. That number's greater in Utah. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not telling you if you're taking... I don't know who's doing and who's not. But... If you are, I would seek God and make sure that is what he wants. Find out if there's some areas in our life that we've created such stress by violating God's word and, and, and with our health, maybe. With our finances, maybe. With the way we are spiritually with the Lord. Listen, if you're born again, the Holy Spirit lives in you. You are going to create tremendous tension in yourself if you violate the word of God openly. It's going to bring tremendous stress into your home. Tremendous stress to know that God lives in me, God the Holy Spirit lives in me, Jesus lives in me, the Bible says this, and I'm going to do that. That's pretty stressful. That's pretty stressful. And I don't know how many wouldn't need to be on any kind of mood-enhancing help if we humbled ourselves before God. There'd still be some folks, because guess what? Your brain's an organ in your body, okay? So let me just throw the other angle in here, the other side of this. Um, if I have a kidney problem, I need to take some medicine for it. Sometimes things don't fire right up there. Sometimes chemicals won't, won't share like they're supposed to in your mind. And, and you can have no good reason whatsoever other than something's not firing right, and you might need some, uh, something to help you through that time, Okay. Again, I'm not a doctor, I'm, and I'm, not, uh, I'm just trying to say there's both sides to this, okay? There, there are people that do need some help with that. And then he says, is it well with thy husband? Can I tell you something, guys? No, it's not. Not in this case, it wasn't. This guy had the two most common problems that American men have, and he wasn't even American. He thought, in verse 19, he belittled domestic issues. Um, a lack of inst interest in domestic problems. Verse 19, and he said unto his father, my head, my head. He didn't say, my little finger, my little finger. I mean, guys, what would it take to get our attention? He says, my head, my head. That's where our brain is. That, I mean, you just can't have serious problems in your head and ignore it. And you know what dad says? Hey, could one of you guys take him to mom? He didn't take it serious. I know, again, there's got to be some kind of a balance. I'm not going to, you know, uh, go crazy every time somebody has the littlest injury at my home. Somebody, you know, uh, especially boys, I I'm wanting to, you know, toughen up and be tough and, you know, get bruised here and there and cut here and there and banged up here and there and get up and go again. But guys, there's got to be some point where, where you'd handle it. Where you wouldn't just say, hey, go to your mom. And sometimes, again, because the wives are often more perceptive, you may not see that there's an actual need there. Because some of the greatest hurts are internal. They're emotional. They're, 
uh, things that a kid's going through. And, <laughs> and dad's, you know, however old he is, and he's like, eh, he's a first grader, he'll get over it. I mean, Brother Russ mentioned something in his lesson this morning, it was really good, about how when he went to school in the seventh grade, some things he was trying to accomplish in that first couple days. And it didn't go well because of an accident he had with some food. And, you know, he remembers that to this day. He remembers that to this day. And could the average dad have a seventh grade son come home and, 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 and even care if he said, Dad, I went to school today. I was really hoping things would go a certain way. And they didn't, and I'm just devastated. Could the average dad, I think the average mother could relate to that. I think she could get a hold of, I think she could listen, I think she could care, I think she could help. I'm not sure the average dad could. So let's don't be average dads. Because the average dad just doesn't spend any time with the kids. Doesn't talk to them at all. Less than 30 seconds a day. Let's don't be average dads. She sends, uh, sorry, he gets sent home to mom and dies. So domestic problems around the house, little things around the house. I know there's this that needs fixed and that that needs fixed. And guys, let, I don't know if you're here, listening or not. I think you are because it's real quiet. But um, when she says something like, you know, the screen needs to be replaced so I can open the window and air can flow through the house. And you say to yourself, the screen needs to be replaced so air. She has no idea what I dealt with all day at work. I had to deal with... I mean, blah, blah, the she's upset about a screen? And sometimes we just got to back up and realize again that the home is her like nest. It's her place of security. If she needs a screen fixed, fix it. There you go. Or get it fixed, okay? Um, and while we're all high and mighty about, hey, I'm the, I'm the this and I'm the that, and why are you the this and that? Guy, you know, ladies, sometimes you could help him know why he's the this and that in a wonderful way. When he comes home from work, if you get to be a stay-at-home mom or something, you could say, honey, thank you so much for being a provider. Thank you so much for working so hard. We just so appreciate it. Kids, do you realize what dad, you know, that could help a lot. Because if he thinks he's totally unappreciated and then supposed to come home and just fix stuff all night, Yes, he should be mature enough to be able to stop and go, well, the whole reason I traveled all over the country last week was for these folks that I'm coming home to, and if they have a need, that's the whole reason I traveled all over the country last week. Let's fix it. Yeah. I know he should be able to do that, but sometimes he's just human too. And he just needs the wife to brag on him and encourage him about going all over the country last week for the family or going and working really hard out in the hot sun. I mean, so I'm looking around here, I'm with some of these jobs are tough. You ever poured concrete? You ever done it when it's a hundred? You ever done it when it's a hundred? And the chemicals have to be just right and you just have no room for air and it's a hundred and you're thirsty and you're about to dehydrate and you're getting dizzy but you got to finish because there's no way you can go clear over there and get a drink and get back here before that's going to be out of control. And, and then you get home, can you fix the screen door? Well, yeah, it needs to be fixed. Right. And on the other hand, he needs to be appreciated. A lot. It goes both ways. So, is it well with the husband? No. Look at verse 23. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. I'm not even going to take time to explain to you, husband. You think the only time God matters is Sundays. I don't have time to talk to you. I don't have time to explain it. It's going to be okay because even though you don't get it, I'm going to God. Husband, if you think that this is all about Sundays and Sunday mornings and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, it's not. It's about everybody in your family is going to live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever somewhere. 
And while on earth, they can have a relationship with the God of the Bible. And you guys can experience Christ and the things that matter most, not only in time, but in all of eternity because you're born again and you're children of the King of Kings and you got a life to live now and forever and ever and ever. And it needs to start right now. It needs to be all out Jesus, not tack him on Sunday morning when I feel like getting up. Sunday night when I'm really feeling it. And Wednesday, I mean, if the whole world falls apart, we might consider Wednesday night. Hey, this is our church. Amen. This is the assembly Jesus purchased with his own blood. It needs to be taken serious. We need to be gathering together and learning the things of God, encouraging one another. You bring the Spirit of God with you every time you come to church. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. It says, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath, defied, denied, sorry, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And it's talking about taking care of him physically, but you know what? It's even more important to take care of him spiritually. We need to care for our families. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 4, and fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Dads, it's our responsibility to have a, a spiritual home, not the wife's. In this story here, the wife's out there doing it all. And then he says, is it well with their child? Their child's dead. Their child's dead. Their child doesn't, that body doesn't have life in it anymore. It's dead. And some of us, we have children that don't know Jesus as their Savior yet. Some of us have children that know Jesus as their Savior, but they're wandering, and they're darting all over the place, and they're making really bad decisions that are going to really hurt the rest of their life, and they really need parents. They don't need best friends. They need people that love them. They need people that are willing to talk with them and care about them, and sometimes let them go get a, a bump or two. And when they're ready to come back, be that father with open arms. Is it well with thee? Now, their child went from being dead to alive, and here's how it happened real quick. Persistence. Look at verse 27. I said I'd be back. And when she came to the man of God, and when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away, and the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. She got a hold of God. She got a hold of God's man. And I want us to get a hold of God. I, I don't know what to do about my child. Get a hold of God. He knows what to do about your child. I don't know what to do about my child. He's this and he's that or she's this and she's that. You know what? The, probably the very first thing you can do about your child is deal with your own heart. Make sure it's thoroughly given over to God for his honor, for his glory, that this body of yours is yielded to God, that this mind of yours is yielded to God. That's the first thing you can do for your child, Dad. Give yourself to God. Give yourself to God. Give yourself to your wife. Give yourself to your children. Time with your children. Time with your wife. Time with your family. Doing things together. Who cares how much money you make if they never see their dad? It doesn't matter. If you've ever flown... There used to be these magazines that had all these things you could buy, and there'd always be somewhere in there this really nice picture that said something like 100 years from today. No child would care what kind of car you had, how many bedrooms your home had, how many bathrooms your home had, what kind of clothes they wore. But they will care whether or not they had a mom and dad. They'll care whether or not they knew the Lord for sure. So persistence. And then privacy, verse 33. He went in and shut the door and got a hold of God. Children need to have time with, in prayer with spiritual leaders, with their parents especially. And then pray for God's protection on them and give it over to the Lord and wait on the Lord. He went in, laid on him. I mean, you'd have thought right there. Here's, they, they thought the staff would take care of it. You'd think if Elisha went in there and laid on him and prayed and laid on him, and you'd just think he just jumped right up, but he didn't. He had to go back out in the hall and just pace and pray and beg God and wait on God. And when God said it's time, he went back in there again and came back. He came back to life. Don't give up on your kids. Maybe you just need to pace a little bit more. Maybe you need to fall on your face again. It's, 
impossible, I think, to always have the same exact burden. I remember when I was so burdened for my grandparents, I couldn't hardly speak their name without crying. I remember going through years where I was burdened for them, prayed for them, but I could speak their name without crying. It wasn't always the same, but I never gave up. I never quit praying. Don't give up. Don't quit praying because you may hear them sneeze one of these days. <laughs> you might hear them sneeze one of these days. Can you imagine if you're sitting in church and that kid you thought would never be back showed up back there and sneezed and you knew that, you knew that, you knew that sneeze. You knew whose sneeze that was. And then halfway through the service, right in the middle of the preaching, that kid gets up and walks down here and falls on his face before God. Can you imagine that? That stuff happens. Yeah. Happens when people don't quit pacing, don't quit praying. Don't give up and listen for the sneeze. Let's pray.